of prayer, and uh, we're going to pray for Linda Costa this morning. I got a text from Dennis. She's got some eye surgery that uh, the doctor says is pretty significant coming up on Tuesday, so we want to pray for her. We prayed uh, for George last week, and he's made some improvement. Praise the Lord for that. He's got lots of progress to make, and so we want to continue to pray for George. And then uh, friends of mine, Crystal and uh, Sheldon Bilge, planted a church in the southern part of Burnsville, and uh, they've got I think five little kids, four little kids, and she got COVID and is in the hospital with that and pneumonia. And uh, so we want to pray for Crystal this morning as well as we pray through our, our list of other items. So let's go ahead and bow our hearts in a moment of prayer and just invite the Lord's presence to be with us. Lord, thank you for this day and the opportunity we have to worship you, to be together, to, uh, to encourage one another, to lift each other up, and to learn from your word together. We just want to commit our time this morning to you, this service to you for your honor and your glory. And Lord, we do pray for uh, for Linda this morning as she prepares for surgery and they're in isolation waiting for that surgery to happen on Tuesday. We just pray that they will feel your presence in their home today as they tune in and watch service, uh, surround them with your grace and your mercy and uh, just be with Linda and the medical team that will care for her on Tuesday. Lord, we continue to pray for George this morning. We pray for just complete healing in his body. We thank you and rejoice over the progress that has been made. And uh, just believe that you'll continue that, that healing process. And that he would, uh, would be healthy and strong and to be released and continue uh, feeling your strength and power at work in his body. We pray for Crystal this morning. And she's uh, working through this at the hospital as well. COVID, pneumonia, and all those things that are going on, we pray, Lord, for your healing touch in her body. Direct the doctors as they care for her. We pray, Lord, this morning for Pastor Doring as she leads Faith United Methodist Church. We just pray your blessing on her life and ministry. We pray for Faith Church, Lord, as well, that you would use them as, as a beacon of light and hope in our community to bless their services and their ministry within our community. Think of our churches in Panama today. We pray for La Mesa campus and, uh, and the work that's happening through their church and people that are, are tapping into the feeding program that's available and, and all of the things that are happening. We pray your blessing and strength. We continue to lift Pastor Sonia and uh, her lung issue before you and just for complete healing, Lord. We think of our missionaries. We pray for Richard Baker and Kim is. They, as he leads the Youth Alive ministry for, for student ministries across the Minnesota, uh, as he travels, as he interacts with students and teaches in youth ministries and working on school campuses, Lord, that he will continue to feel your favor as, as he does the work that you've called him to do. And we pray as well for the West Patals as they continue to minister in Ukraine and across the former Soviet Union, teaching in, in Bible schools and helping to train new pastors as Nancy uh, leads uh, medical missions in both of those countries and, and they visit villages and bring health care to those those villages we just pray your protection and provision and care over their lives and we pray for church family members today with Tom and Teresa Reynolds we just pray your blessing on their marriage and their home and Tom as he's beginning to get out in the fields and do the work that's there for, for planting season uh, just pray your protection over him and, and his, the work that happens there and we just pray your blessing on their marriage and home as well. We pray for Carl and Ida Sonnenberg and their family. We pray, Lord, your blessing on their marriage and on the work that he does with the city. And, uh, Lord, that you just bless this family, strengthen and encourage each other. And all again, Lord, we just ask that you'll come and minister to us as we sing songs of praise and worship to this morning. In Jesus' name.
draws closer to you. Help us, Lord, as we as we live this life for Christ, that we can we can best reflect and better reflect the image, the likeness, the grace, and the mercy of Jesus to those around us. We ask these things in His name. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. You can be seated. <clears throat> Just a couple of things, um, and then we're going to dismiss our kids. Um, there's a number of things in the bulletin, and we just encourage you to be aware of those. The one piece that is not in the bulletin that we want to touch base on with the prayer team that uh, uh, ministers in the community, and they're going to be meeting together on May 1st at 10 o'clock here in the fellowship hall. And uh, just prior, at the beginning of that meeting, I'm going to... I'll be here. I'm going to do some teaching. I've heard a number of people over the last year or so say, I just don't know what I'd say if I was going to talk to somebody about the Lord. I'm not quite sure how I'd go about doing that and what I would say. And so there's a, there's a process I'm going to walk you through that Saturday morning um, to give you some, just give you a tool. And, uh, a lot of times I'll just talk about tools in our toolbox. I've got a, three or four toolboxes at my house filled with a variety of tools. I don't use them all of them. But they're there. When I need them, they're there. And so I'm able to give you a tool, and it's a, it's a very short and easy process that you can learn that will give you some confidence in sharing your faith, sharing Jesus with somebody that you may bump into at the grocery store or the gas station or the department store. And you can begin to have a conversation, and the next thing you know, you'll be sharing the love of Jesus with them. And it's a very easy process takes a lot of the fear out of it, so I'd encourage you to come that Saturday morning, May 1st, 10 o'clock, do the fellowship hall, and we'd love to have you come and grab a tool, grab a hold of a tool that you can use to help people know Jesus. So we're going to let our kids, ages 3 through 6th grade, be dismissed, and uh, the younger kids are going down the hall here towards the fellowship hall to a classroom, the older kids are going with Josh back here in the classroom behind us. So this morning we're going to get back to uh, the book of Revelation. We've been studying through this uh, incredible book of Revelation for, uh, this is the 18th message in this series. And so uh, I'm not sure if we'll get it all in today or not, but we're going to get started on that. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 14. Most of the scripture verses will be on the screen for you, but I'd encourage you if you've got a Bible, a hard copy Bible, like mine, or if you maybe you've got on your phone or your tablet, it's always good to track along with that as we read scripture, um, because sometimes you, you're going to be able to want to highlight something or, or underline it, and and then go back and look at it again later. So we encourage you in that direction as well. So you can see on the screen that the, the message, the title for our message this morning is Decision Time. That'll make a little bit more sense as we walk through this chapter. And I got to get something in my mouth so that I don't cough. You forgive me for that. We're going to jump right into this. Remember, maybe some of you uh, closer to my age would remember uh, when we were growing up on Saturdays. Typically, the ABC had a, a show on TV called ABC Wide World of Sports. Do you remember that? And, and I loved the beginning of that. I like to watch the different sporting events, but I love the beginning of that because what got our attention, what drew us into watching that show for many of us, I think, was that opening section. When, when um, the announcer would say, uh, ABC Wild World of Sports, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. <laughs> and as he was saying the agony of defeat, they showed a guy on the, on the big ski hill, or the big jump, and he's at the top and he's on his way down, and as he's going down is when Howard Cosell would say, or whoever, the agony of defeat. You'd see this guy crash on this ski jump. And then he would go off the edge and go tumbling down the hill. And that was the agony of defeat. What I didn't know at that time, I didn't know until more recently, was that skier who, who fell down and the, was the epitome of the agony of defeat made a choice as he was going down the hill to fall down. He did it on purpose because he, while it seems kind of stupid on the surface, to him, in that moment, it was the smartest thing that he could do. Because the surface of the ski jump ramp, that hill, had become altogether too fast. It had become kind of icy. And he realized, I'm going way too fast for this jump. What he realized was, if I make this jump, I'm going to go past the slope of the hill, and I'm going to land on the flat part 
of the hill. And if I land on the flat part of the hill, I'm going to break both of my legs and maybe my hips. It's going to be a disaster if I land on the flat rather than on the slope. And so can you imagine all of these things rushing through your mind as you're going 60, some 70 miles an hour down this hill and you realize I'm about to die if I don't do something. So the choice he makes is to fall down on the hill, and it becomes the theme of ABC's Wild Wolf Sports, the agony of defeat, as it looks like he has this incredible crash. And the reality was he got up with a headache that went away in a couple hours when he took some aspirin. But he knew that if I land on the flat, it's going to be a lot more of, than a headache. It's going to be joints and, and everything else that are going to be messed up, and I may not do this again the rest of my life. So he made a choice. And deciding to bail on that jump, while it looked like he should have been seriously injured, it wasn't. And so the point that I'm trying to, to get us to begin to understand, and we'll, we'll talk more about it as we move through the message this morning, is this. Sometimes to change our course in life can be just as dramatic as that agony of defeat. And sometimes it can be just as painful as that first fall and then that, that crash at the bottom. But listen, friends, the change is infinitely better than the fatal landing at the end. And what we'll see today as we work our way through this, continuing the systematic study through the book of Revelation, here in chapter 14, is that it's decision time for all of those who are left on earth. Now, we know we've been talking about Revelation for a while, and we understand that by the time we get to Revelation 14, the church has been raptured away, and, and as believers, we're, we're not here anymore. And this is, this is really about the people who were left on earth. And there have been perhaps millions and millions of people who had heard about Christ before but never made a decision. And, and they've come to faith in Christ. We'll talk about some of those being martyred. Lots of them being martyred in this time frame. But now, as, as we move through this, this book, this chapter, we see that God is is giving us here in this chapter an outline uh, of God's dealings with humanity during the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. As Jesus now is revealing this to John in very rapid succession, six different events and statements that are literally staggering to our imaginations. And so we're going to go ahead and look at the first five verses. And, and as I've done before in this series, I'm going to be reading from the scriptures from the uh, Christian Standard Bible this morning. So it, it may sound a little different than the, the version that you have in your hands, but it's, it's all God's word. And it's good. And, and it's true. And it's powerful. And it can be life-changing. So Revelation chapter 14, we're going to read the first five verses. It says, Then I looked, and there was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion. And with him were 140, the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. I heard a sound from heaven like the sound of cascading waters, like the rumbling of loud thunder. The sound I heard was also like harpists playing on their harps. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders but no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had be, been redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women since they remained virgins. They were redeemed from humanity as the first fruits for God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths, for they are blameless. Mm -hmm. Lord, is praying these in the next few minutes as we begin to dig into this chapter. Help us to have ears and hearts that will hear and receive and uh, empower us by your spirit to grab hold of the pieces that you need for us uh, corporately and individually to be able to hear and know today. Guide my words as I speak your heart this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So right off the bat, as we're ju jumping into this chapter, we see the same 144,000 that we discussed in an earlier chapter, chapter 7. And just as a quick review, these 144,000 are Jewish people. Uh, they're described even in here in chapter 14 as, as male virgins. There are 12,000 of them from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And these are, are people, that men that believe in Jesus as Messiah and as their Lord and Savior. And this is all taking place, as I mentioned earlier, in the time of the Great Tribulation. 
Each of these have been specifically and specially sealed by God with his name imprinted on their foreheads to keep them safe from the Antichrist and all of the judgments, God's judgments that are being poured out on the earth and her inhabitants. And again, let me just remind us that Revelation, especially after this, the second, third chapter, none of it really grows, goes in chronological order. So when you're reading this, don't think I'm moving on to the next thing. Uh, it tells us a segment and then the next number of chapters repeats that, only goes into deeper detail. So sometimes that can be really confusing for us. So let me just remind us again, it's not about being chronological order and the way things play out. It's we're given it and then we're given it again in greater detail. And so that's what we're getting here in chapter 14 as well. So these 144,000 are now standing on Mount Zion along with Jesus. And this scene is considered to be the preservation and triumph of this 144,000. Because, because of their faith and their commitment to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But, but there's, a, there's so much to talk about in this section. Such as when you and I come to repentance and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. When, friends, when we come to faith in Christ, when we repent of our sin and ask Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, God puts a seal on us, puts a seal in us, to be exact, and it's the Holy Spirit. We're marked as belonging to Him, even as these 144,000 are marked with a literal sign on their foreheads here in, in Revelation. And so God gives us a foretaste through the Holy Spirit of what we can expect and should expect when we get to heaven. And a reminder for us, because the Spirit lives in us, and He's teaching us, and He's convicting us, and He's drawing us into a deeper relationship with Christ. It's that constant reminder that, oh yeah, I do belong to Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm being convicted. That's why I'm being drawn to read the Bible. That's why I'm being drawn to church services. That's why I'm being drawn to praise and worship, because the Spirit is in me, and He, he loves those things, and that draws me to those things. It's that reminder that I belong to Christ. In fact, I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 13 and 14. It's already on the screen for you. It says, In Him, in Christ, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed it. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of His glory. So we get the gift of the Holy Spirit as this down payment, as the guarantee that one day we're going to be with Jesus for all of eternity in heaven. It's that constant reminder, and Paul would give us that, that teaching that really runs perfectly in line with what we're reading here in, in Revelation. And so there's also this, the voice of God. It, it's described in, in this chapter, we just read these first few verses, like many waters, as a mighty and powerful as the Niagara Falls would be, many times over. And, it's, and at the same time, it's described as soothing and peaceful. As the many quiet brooks bring in comfort and solace. I've got an app on my phone that I love to listen to. The little brook streams as they rumble. It's just, uh, boy, I'll just have put me to sleep in just a minute. So when I get on the airplane, put my earphones in and listen to that for about five minutes. And then somebody's waking me up saying, sir, you're snoring. Could you just knock <laughs> <not> the <laughs> Praise God. No matter what the sound is like, we need to be attentive to what it is, whether it's through outward circumstances or inward promptings, an audible voice, or through his written word. The point is that we, friends, we need to be listening because something, because it's something that most of us aren't very good at doing. We hear a lot of stuff, but we don't necessarily listen to many things, right? I get accused of that at home. You, you heard me, but you didn't listen to me. <laughs> and, and I think all of us, we have, that, we have that ability to hear things, but not necessarily listen to things. And so we, we have to be listening, especially, especially in the busyness of our lives today. We have to make some choices that I'm not just going to hear this. I'm going to listen to this and let it get a hold of me. Well, what I believe the Lord would like for us to concentrate on this morning is the incredible commitment of this group of men. Because, first of all, they're virgins. That, that means they've never married, they've never had sexual encounters. They've really, they've dedicated their lives to Christ. 
to his kingdom. And, and Paul would say in his writings that that's a calling and a special gift that very few are called to, but, but embrace it if that's your calling. So we're reading through this, and as we even get up to chapter 14, we're seeing horror after horror that fills these last days known as the Great Tribulation, as natural catastrophes and violence engulf the earth, along with what, what will be the worst holocaust that the world, this world has ever witnessed, as millions and millions of people who, who have come to faith in Christ during this great tribulation are now being killed because of their faith in Christ. They, they're not taking the mark of the beast. They're not doing those things. And that sets them up for, for martyrdom. There's a special and a sincere commitment to Jesus that, is, that will definitely be needed in order to stand up for him in these times. It's something that the 144,000 do as they, as they make a vow to commit their lives wholly to Jesus and never involve themselves in any of the affairs of this world or to deny him. Further, they will stand and speak only truth. We're told in this passage that no guile, no untruth is found in their speech. And in what a contrast this will be to those who are left behind and follow the Antichrist. We're told in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 to 5. Well, it's not going to be on the screen, but you can write that down and go and look at it later. But we're told there that in these days, in these last days, in this tribulation period, people will be, and it kind of sounds like the 21st century to me, yeah. but it says, it says people will be lovers of self and money, that they will be boastful, that they will be proud, that they will be demeaning and ungrateful and unholy and slanders without self-control. Doesn't that sound like, like today? I'm not sure. But uh, and it also says they will love evil and not good. They will love themselves more than they love God. Untruthfulness, lying, and deception will be the norm of the world. We're moving that way at a, at a breakneck pace. And it will be, it, it will be a, 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 in no wonder since the all of the people at that time that are that haven't decided to make a choice to repent and live for Jesus, they are going to be following Satan through the Antichrist and the false prophet. And of course, Jesus said of Satan that he is the father of lies. And finally, the 144,000, they are so committed to holy living, they are without fault before God. They're described as blameless and undefiled and unpolluted by the world. <coughs> Can you imagine that somebody would look at your life and say, that person is blameless. Mm -hmm. Blameless before God. And, and to live a life that is undefiled and unpolluted by the world. Now, now, most people don't believe that that could even be possible. But the truth is, such a life can be lived through God's grace and mercy by the power of the Holy Spirit. We incorporate His grace, His mercy into our lives, and the Spirit enables us to live in a way that we could never live in our own strength. It's challenging for sure, but, but one that must be undertaken because the world today desperately needs men and women who will commit themselves fully and wholly to Jesus Christ. We've got, to be, we've got to be different. We have to look and sound and act differently than the world. Friends, we live in a world where lying and deception seems to be second nature. And, and, and God needs people who are willing to change their direction. Men and women who are willing to make a commitment to holy living and the truth. I'm convinced that today God is calling us to make the same kind of commitment that is a commitment to follow Jesus wholly and completely. That, that we will follow him no matter where he leads us. No matter how difficult that path may seem on the outset. Today the world around us needs people who will either commit or recommit their lives so holy, so sold out to Jesus. And to be those followers that he desires and describes in Luke chapter 9. What we read in verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone wants to follow after me, let them deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me. The next thing we see is the gospel being preached into the, the entire world. It's, we're going to pick it up in verses 6 and 7 of, of chapter 14. 
John writes there, he said, Then I saw another angel flying high overhead with etern the eternal gospel to announce to the inhabitants of the earth, to every tribe, uh, nation, tribe, language, and people. Verse 7, he spoke with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. Friends, it's during these last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation that evil is running rampant. Jews and believers will be scattered throughout the earth, hiding and scratching for food. They'll be fleeing from the Antichrist and in the Holocaust that is coming after them because of their faith and trust in Jesus. Furthermore, it's that the earth's population and land mass is going to be just devastated with all of the things that are happening. We've looked at some of those in the past chapters. We understand as well that at this point over half of the population of the planet will have been killed or destroyed in one form or another. And whole areas of the earth will have become inhabitable because of what is happening. And it is to this world that God again uses angels. You remember in Hebrews it says in past days God used the prophets and the angels to proclaim the gospel. But now in these last days he sent his son. But now we get to Revelation 14, and we see that, he, that the Son is, is not the one proclaiming, but now God has sent angels back to begin to proclaim the gospel message. And it's, again, in Hebrews chapter 2, the first three verses there, it says, For this reason, we must pay all, all the more attention to what we have heard, so that we will not drift away. What is he talking about? Drift away from our faith in Christ. We've got to pay attention to what the scriptures say so that we don't drift away from what we've learned and experienced in Christ. For if the message spoken through angels was legally binding, and every transgression and disobedience received its just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation through Christ? So, so the writer of Hebrews warns us, we've got to pay attention to this. We've got to press in to this walk with Christ. The word given by God for his angels to proclaim proved true and binding. And the writer of Hebrews then contrasts that time with our present time in, in that now we have the words of Jesus himself and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So how will we escape judgment if we neglect the gospel message? And again, the point that I really want to make here is, is, is that at this time, God reverts back to these angelic messengers to get the gospel preached throughout the whole world. Now, this is, I'm going to give you a verse from Matthew that people will struggle with because they think, they think one thing when in reality it's another thing. We'll touch on that in just a second. Go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. Someone had asked Jesus about the signs of the time and what will we know and all of these things. And this is what Jesus said as a part of that larger answer. He said, this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, some people think that the rapture of the church isn't going to happen until the gospel is proclaimed all over the earth. That's not what Jesus said. He said, the end will come. So go back to Revelation chapter 14. We're here in chapter 14 of Revelation, and God is sending angelic messages to all the nations, all the tongues, all the people, because the end is coming. The, the end of those three and a half years, and his final judgment is coming, and he's sending messengers to make sure that every person left on this planet has an opportunity. This is the grace and mercy of God. These people that are left on the planet are in an absolute rebellion against him, and yet he still sends angels to give them the good news and an opportunity to repent and trust Jesus. Before the end comes, as Jesus described it. There was an evangelist that walked into a country store and he asked the clerk, he said, are you a member of the Christian family? The clerk kind of looked at him. No, they live two miles down the road on the left. The evangelist said, well, let me, let me phrase that a different way. Are you lost? The evangelist says, no, sir, I, I'm not lost. I, I've lived here for 30 years. I, I, I know exactly where I am. <laughs> Evangelist says, well, let me, let me try this another way. Are you ready for judgment day? Clerk says, well, when is that going to be? Evangelist says, well, it could be today or tomorrow. Clerk says, well, 
Let me know when you figure out exactly what it is because my wife's probably going to want to be there both days. <laughs> we we, we got to know. We got to know how to talk to people about the kingdom of God. We got to know how to, how to put it in a place that they can hear it and understand it. And isn't it beautiful that God sends the angels in these last moments to clearly proclaim the gospel. See, even those that are in the deepest rebellion have an opportunity to hear and know the truth. Here in America, where, where there are, are churches and Christian TV and radio stations and podcasts and blogs and blogs and so much more, people tend to take Christianity and the gospel message for granted. They will often yawn and say, oh yeah, it's, it's nice that Jesus died for me. I'm so happy for that. And by the way, thanks a lot, but, but if you don't remind me, and if you don't mind, I've got other plans for Sunday. I've got some things that I need to get done that I haven't gotten done yet. We, we, can't, we can't take the truth of the gospel. We can't take this, this thing of walking with Jesus as lightly as that. Today we're living in what is referred to as a day of grace. A time where God reaches out in love to this lost world. Friends, we have to be sure of this, that the day of judgment is coming. And that's the message of the book of Revelation. To fear God and give Him glory implies repentance. Because it's necessary to repent of our sin. We've got to have faith in Jesus. But faith in Jesus brings us to repentance. Mm -hmm. It's that point of recognizing my sin separates you from Jesus. And, I, and repentance is making a choice to turn from my sins... But not just turn from my sins, because if I just turn from my sins, I could be going towards Derek, and he can't get me to heaven. As nice as the guy he is, or I could be going towards Cheryl or Lois, and as nice as they are, they can't get me to heaven. So I have to turn from my sins and turn to Jesus. I've got to go to the cross where, where Jesus died for my sins. That's the significance of repentance. It's not just turning away from our sins, but who are we turning to? Because Jesus said, I am the way truth and the light and no one comes to the father except through me so repentance takes us away from our sin and points us toward jesus the, the way the truth and the life so that that we can have eternal life with him when we do that we repent while we're still in this day of grace or these days of grace so that we don't have to live through what the book of Revelation is describing. And, and, and you, if you haven't missed those, those are, all those messages are on our webpage. You can probably find videos of them on our YouTube page or on our Facebook page. And you can go back and catch up with that if you want to do that. But, but there are some horrific things that are happening in this book of Revelation. And we don't have to worry about them because we can walk in faith with Christ. And before all the horrific things happen, there's going to be this incredible moment when God says to the archangel, blow the trumpet, buddy, blow the trumpet. And it says in the scripture, and then the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up in the air to be with them. And that kicks off all of this horrific things that begins to happen as we read through the book of Revelation. I've run out of time. We're going to pick up this chapter again next week. We're going to close in a word of prayer. And uh, we're going to give us an opportunity because maybe you're not ready. If that angel blew the trumpet today and the rapture of the church took place, you may not be ready for that today. The only way you can be ready is to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. To do that, you first have to repent of your sin. That's how you can get to a place of being able to have a relationship with Him. We just talked about that. And so we're going to close in prayer. And if you haven't trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior... If you haven't repented of your sin, I want to give you that invitation and opportunity this morning. And we'll pick up with Revelation 14 next Sunday. Father, thank you for your grace that we live in a, in a day, in an age of grace and mercy. Where, where we can easily recognize our lostness, our sinfulness. And we can turn away from that sin and trust in Jesus to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we can be prepared for the trumpet to sound and our call and that rapturing us up into the presence of, of you and in heaven. 
going to pray that, that if there would be any here this morning, in the auditorium with us, or perhaps watching the live stream today, that, that they're not prepared for that. They've not trusted in Jesus. They've not repented of their sin. Father, I pray that, that even now your Holy Spirit would convict their hearts and draw them to that point of, of courage that says, yes, I need to know Jesus. I need to have a relationship with him. And, and then in these moments that they will, they will say yes to Jesus. And they'll join with me in a prayer of repentance so that they can know that they're prepared and ready for what you have for them and, and begin this journey with Jesus. Oh, Holy Spirit, speak now. Holy Spirit, that you would move and draw even in these moments. Friends, as you continue to pray, just for a moment, I ask you to keep your, your heads bowed, your eyes closed, just, just to, just to, to kind of respect those around you. If you've never trusted in Jesus, you, maybe you've gone to church all your life, but you've never repented of your sin. Maybe, maybe you've done all the churchy things. You give money every week or every so often, and, and maybe you've been confirmed, or maybe you've been baptized, or maybe you, you, you've been a church member, but you've never repented of your sin. That's the peace. That's the peace. It's not the churchy things. It's repentance and beginning this relationship with Jesus. And if you've never done that peace, I want to invite you, if you just lift up your hand, just for a moment, I'm going to be kind of glancing across the auditorium. Nobody else is looking. I want to lead you in prayer of repentance to help you begin this relationship with Christ. And if you're watching the live stream, you can you can send us an email, and I'll connect with you. I got, a, I got an e a phone call on Saturday from somebody that watched the live stream and said, I want to come and be baptized because I've just repented of my sin. Praise be to God. But if that's you this morning, would you slip up your hand? Just hold it up just for a moment. So I can catch that, and I want to pray with you this morning, prayer of repentance, and begin to help you with that process. Is that you today? Jesus, Jesus, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Hallelujah. Jesus. Lord, thank you for being with us. Thank you for the gift of your word. Draw us closer to you. Help us to be witnesses for you, that, that those around us that don't know who you are, don't have a relationship with you, can be drawn into a relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want to invite you to stand, and then we're going to close in a song, and then we'll be dismissed.